is it easy to use there no sir not yet just a minute now it is okay yes yes uh, so a very good afternoon to all the viewers uh, myself dr rajesh singh uh, associate professor parul institute of law parul university today we have our uh, one big guest and who is the honorable mr justice vimlesh kumar shukla sir who is the former acting chief justice of allahabad high court and uh, let let me introduce about uh, uh, mr vimlesh kumar shukla sir uh honorable justice vimlesh kumar shukla sir is the former judge of allahabad high court he graduated in arts in the year 1977 from allahabad university and passed llb in the year 1980 from allahabad university he enrolled as an advocate in the year 1981 in uttar pradesh uh, bar council allahabad he started to practice in the areas of civil and constitutional law in the high court of allahabad He was elevated elevated as a permanent judge on twenty first December two thousand two, where he served till second June two thousand seventeen, and he was also uh, being made former acting uh, Chief Justice of Allahabad High Court. Furthermore, I just introduce uh, Mr. M N Patel sir, who is the Provost of Parul University. M N Patel sir is the Vice Chancellor of Gujarat, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, earlier for Gujarat University for the period of three years. He was the principal of L D. college of engineering amdavad gujarat for 10 years he was member secretary admission committee for professional course of gujarat he was vice chancellor officiating gujarat technological university amdavad gujarat he was professor and principal at the government engineering college modasa he was the member of aiu association of indian universities governing council he was member of governing body of indian institute of management amdavad i ima he was also the member of inquiry committee by the ugc he was also the member of academic governing body of autonomous college institute st javier science college and bvm vv nagar he was also the staff affairs committee of aiu he was also nominated as the member of aicte central regional committee bhopal and currently he is the provost at the parul university furthermore i will just introduce dr akhil sayya sir who is the director of the parul institute of law and the dean at the faculty of parul university he did his msc physics and llm from okay. business law okay. and okay. phd in the area of public private partnership in the legal education he was the first phd holder of gujarat okay. national law university gandhinagar okay. so not taking more time i just uh, just a minute and not taking more time i just uh, tell uh mn patel sir to warm welcome our speaker and honorable mr. former honorable judge mr vimlesh kumar shukla sir over to you sir ji namaskar and good afternoon to all viewers uh, and we are happy to share that uh, today in our webinar uh, we have got uh, a learned person honorable justice vimlesh shukla ji as a resource person and as we are lucky enough that his experience of long time whatever deliberation will take place our uh, students and viewers are at the benefit uh, no doubt uh, parul university is that university which is expanding his horizons like anything during last 6 uh, year we have just grown from 0 uh, to today we have more than 35000 student and 34 uh, institution 22 faculty out of that law is one of the faculty where also we are getting a very good uh, admission and as far as support from various judiciaries are concerned uh, in the leadership of akil and uh, rajesh singh we are getting a very good uh, speakers and our students are at the benefit sure as far foreign nation students they are also learning here the international law so obviously all are going to learn something what is uh, the need of a day as far the judiciary is concerned i think i will not take more time but i as a provost i welcome honorable judge for this occasion and having a very good deliberation from his side so that our student can get benefit so again welcome you sir over to you thank you uh, now i will say dr akhil sayya sir to say few words and then we will start our session on the part 3 of the indian constitution the topic of this webinar is the part 3 of the indian constitution over to akhil sir 
Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Actually, today is not a time to talk among ourselves. Uh, we do have Honorable Justice uh, Vimilesh Kumar Shukla, sir. Uh, on behalf of Parul Institute of Law, Faculty of Law, Parul University, and on my personal behalf, I welcome you, sir. It is our great pleasure that you have been kind enough to spare your valuable time for our student, for sake of our student. And the topic is also very interesting and important uh, because uh, fundamental right and uh, Indian constitution have been always a very important point for every citizen in any of the country. And that is what uh, our part three talks about. So it's our great pleasure that uh, today we would we used to take the classes for the student, but today our class will be taken by Andre no, 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 no. So it's a great pleasure for us. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Now I am uh, requesting Honorable Justice uh, Vimlesh Kumar Sukla, sir, to uh, I am handing this session to you, sir, and uh, my Thank students you. and all the teachers are going to listen you. So Thank over you. to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Singh. A very good afternoon to all the members who are virtually present on the virtual platform in question. A very good afternoon to the Vice Chancellor. A very good afternoon to the director, the members of the faculty, the students at large, and all other viewers who have joined this virtual platform in question. Friends, this year is a very important year for the simple reason that our nation is celebrating its 75th year of independence and country is also cherishing the date on which the constitution came into effect on January 26, 1950. And we turned ourselves into a newly formed republic. The constitution of India, as you all know, was adopted by the Constituent Assembly on November 26, 1949, and came into effect a year later, contains the fundamental code and structures signifying India as an independent republic with a democratic government. That is how we have perceived to carry ourselves. We must also recollect and remember that our constitution is the longest written constitution of any country and is considered to be the supreme law of the nation. And our constitution in question, once you will see the structure of our constitution, it contains the framework, powers and duties of government institutions and sets out fundamental rights, directory principles, and what are the duties of citizens. So to have the best of the constitution, there are fundamental rights that have been conferred. There are rights that are known as directory principles. That is the roadmap as to how the nation in question should be put forward. And then a corresponding obligation has also been put upon the citizens as to in what way and manner they should conduct themselves so that they get all the best out of the fundamental rights that have been conferred upon them. Dr. Radha Krishnan was the first speaker of the election of the permanent chairman of the Constitution Constituent Assembly. He proceeded to make a mention and in very simple terms he proceeded to say, say a constitution is the fundamental law of the nation. It should embody and express the dreams and passions, the ideals and aspirations of the people it must be based on the consent of all and respect the rights of all people who belong to this great land. So these were the great words that were used by Dr. Radha Krishnan at the point of time when he spoke for the constitution in question in the, in the constituent assembly and especially in favor of and at the point of time when fundamental rights were being debated upon in the constituent assembly in question. And it was also precisely kept in mind that Different legitimate factors should be kept in mind at the point of time when all these fundamental rights are to be taken note of, that is, dreams and passions, ideals and aspirations, and all these should be clearly reflected at the point of time when fundamental rights and duties are earmarked in the constitution in question. As you would find that as far as our constitution is concerned, it will be clearly reflective from the same that our constitution in question proceeds 
to make a declaration in the terms by taking a pledge in itself and the preamble in question starts by saying we the people of india having solemnly resolved to constitute india into sovereign democratic republic and secure to all its citizen justice liberty equality and fraternity so this is the commitment that has been made by the people of india in its preamble and in order to fulfill this commitment in question the ideal aspirations of the people in question all these fundamental rights in question that is embodied upon in part 3 has been put in place part 3 as you would see along with all other parts that are contained in the constitution here contains the ideals and aspirations of the public in question and it also clearly proceeds to take a note and take a charge that preamble is not a platitude but the mode of its realization is worked out in detail in the constitution and the constitution in fact is a road map the constitution brings into existence different constitutional entities namely the union the states and the union territories and it also creates three major instruments of power namely the legislature the executive and the judiciary it demarcates the jurisdiction minutely and expects them to exercise their respective powers without overstepping their limits this is the beauty of our constitution that has been provided for and this has also been the motto of our constitution and the idea of our constitution that they should function within the spheres allotted to them once such is the factual situation that the constitution is clear on every aspect of the matter as to what would be your specified field the area that you would cover and the power that would be exercised by you in all spheres of life no authority created under the constitution is supreme it is the constitution that is supreme and all the authorities function under the supreme law of the land the constitution in question as you would see all these facts are being mentioned as a preface to part 3 for the simple reason that without understanding all these things part 3 cannot be understood in its real context and meaning it empowers the legislature to make laws in respect of matters enumerated in three list annex to schedule 7 in part of four of the constitution the directive principle state policy are laid down it enjoins it to bring about a social order in which justice social economical and political shall inform all the institutions of national life it directs it to work for an egalitarian society when there is no concentration of wealth where there is plenty when there is equal opportunity for all to education to work to livelihood and where there is social justice all these were the ideals and aspirations that were thought of at the point of time when the constitution in question was being drafted by the constituent assembly in question the constitution in question as you would see that it clearly proceeds to here mark the field in question and also also clearly proceeds to make a mention that nobody no one is superior to each other and at the point of time when there is a conflict the right to resolve this set of situation has been conferred with the judiciary in question that that is the structure in question that we have broadly created for ourselves in the constitution in question now the question is what are the fundamental rights that that is the basic question and that is the essence of part 3 the the fundamental rights are embodied in part 3 of the constitution and as you would see part 3 they can be classified as right to equality right to freedom right against exploitation right to freedom of religion cultural and educational rights right to property and right to constitutional remedies they are the rights of the people preserved by our constitution fundamental rights are the modern name for what have been traditionally known as natural rights once you are a citizen of india or you are a person all these rights are natural rights but in order to reduce it in writing and reduce it in black and white all these facts have been incorporated in the constitution in question and they are described as fundamental rights one author has proceeded to make a mention that there are very that, that there are new hume that, that there are numerous rights that can be termed as fundamental rights 
But the fact of the matter is that it may be true that there are various sites that can be termed as fundamental rights. But as far as these headings are concerned, they are very, very wide enough. And this is this is an inclusive one. It, it will include within its fold the very wide connotation as can be given in the contextual situation as is, it is to be interpreted by the courts. And you will see in number of judges, we will also talk of some judgments later on, that in what way and manner it has been expanded. The scope of these fundamental rights have been expanded to all horizons, all new horizons, which we never even thought of. And even the, even the constitution members, the legislative members, they even didn't thought of that it, it will go to that extent. Now, the fact of the matter is that as far as fundamental rights are concerned, in our system of things, in our scheme of things, the fundamental rights have been given a very transcendental position under our constitution. And as far as those rights are concerned, they are non-negotiable rights and those rights cannot be encroached upon by any authority, either even by the parliament, no such right can be encroached upon by making any such laws, which we'll deliberate on later on. As far as we see that the only limitation that has been provided for is that there are limitations that are enjoined upon that these rights, they are fundamental in nature. They cannot be compromised. Any law cannot be introduced to contravene the same, but regulations can be imposed and the regulations are self-imposed and they are in view of the fact that one, one citizen has a right then the other citizen has also right. There is no conflict of interest in between two citizens, right? And that is why, as far as fundamental rights are concerned, they are fundamental. And being fundamental in nature, you have also got corresponding obligation in question to discharge. That is, right of a citizen has also to be looked into, along with the corresponding rights and obligations that are cast upon the citizen also. So, once fundamental rights are there, then it, it clearly enjoins upon you to be a responsible citizen and not to be an irresponsible citizen. And that is why all these rights have been created that gives you a free hand. You are a free bird to fly whenever, wherever you fly like. But by, at the point of time when you fly, it should not disturb others' right that has also been conferred on the, by, by the same constitution under which your rights have been conferred and your rights have been preserved. What do we see here that there is one famous writer, Danville Austin, and he has proceeded to make a mention in regard to what is this fundamental right, what, what for this fundamental rights stand for. And he proceeds to make a mention by saying that the core of the commitment of the social revolution lies in part three and four in the fundamental rights and, the, and in the directive principle of state policies. The writer proceeds to make a mention that these are the conscience of the institution. These, these mark these words that part three is the conscience of the constitution. Whatever other rights are flowing under the constitution, they are all duties and obligation cast upon all other bodies. But as far as fundamental rights is concerned, it is directly connected to the citizen or the person in question for whose benefit it has been expanded and expounded. And Further mention has been made that a declaration of right has assumed such importance was not surprising. And in reference to this country, he proceeds to make a mention. India was a land of communities of minorities, racial, religious, linguistic, social and caste. For India to become a state, these minorities had to agree to be governed both at the center and in the province by fellow Indian members, perhaps of another minority and not by mediatory third power, the British. On both psychological and political grounds, therefore, the demand for written rights. That was the reason. Though these rights are natural rights, they flow in the shape of natural rights. But in spite of the same, there were some apprehensions. It was reduced in writing by way of fundamental rights. Since rights would provide tangible safeguards against oppression slash proved overwhelming. So, in order to secure confidence in all citizens of the country who were who were to be there or all persons residing within the territory of India, it was reduced in writing. That was the real object. Otherwise, unlike American constitution, there is no written rights provided for. But 
by judicial precedents the rights in question have been created and they have been they are being holding the field here in our case it is clear that the with a very broad mind with a very broad mind we had also suffered the partition also and that was that was a great great thought process that was going on in the members of the constituent assembly that they thought it appropriate for the society that we were going to carve and create out that this should come in black and white and it should be reduced in writing that was the real intent and that is why this writer has proceeded to take note of this fact and what is the importance of this fundamental right has also been noted with our politicians in question and not only at the point of time of partition when it took place even in the year 1928 motilal nehru he proceeded to make a mention when when the struggle for freedom was already ongoing and there was there was nothing to be there in black and white but in spite of that the motilal nehru proceeded to make a mention it is obvious that our first care should be to have our fundamental rights guaranteed in a manner which will not permit the withdrawal under any circumstances so this was our polity at the point of time when freedom struggle was on this was the thought process because we 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 have been sufferers right and right from thousand years at repeatedly aggressions were there we all have been suffering and suffering and suffering that is why it was said that whatever society we are going to formulate that society in question should be assured of a fundamental right and that should be guaranteed in a manner and should not at all be negotiable that meaning thereby that it cannot be withdrawn even i agree that i should be killed i i cannot be killed that was that was that was the intent and purpose of part 3 that fundamental rights are to secure a best life to have the best of human life and that is why in one of the judgments it has been considered that what is article 21 it is it is not just you lick, live you live like a an animal it should be a human existence with all rights all dignity everything that was the concept of fundamental right that fundamental rights give you whatever you want to do you, you are a writer you write you are a lawyer you practice you are a doctor you practice your profession that was the idea that was the beauty and coupled with this you will also see all those rights we will just go through that even the religious minorities they were given liberty to practice their faith they were given liberty to establish institutions of their choice that was the part of the fundamental right that has all been provided for that was the pur- purpose and even pandit jawaharlal nehru the first prime minister of our country he should he also proceeded to make a mention at the point of time when interim report was submitted in reference of acceptance of fundamental rights he proceeded to make a mention by saying a fundamental right should be looked upon not from the point of view of any particular difficulty of the moment but as something that you want to make permanent institution like father like son the father was also towing the same line the son is also towing the same line and just see the difference one statement has been made in the 1928 the other statement is being made in the 1947 at the point of time when constituent assembly debates are ongoing that that is the beauty of a thought process as to how clear vision you have in regard to fundamental rights that is the purpose the other matter should be look, looked upon how important it might be not from this permanent and fundamental point of view but from the mere temporary point of view so other rights can be negotiable as mentioned directive principles or the rights but as far as fundamental rights are concerned they are non negotiable rights and they had to be made permanent right with 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 your nationality being there and being a person you have you have this inherent right that stands protected under the constitution and even a citizen can approach the high court or the supreme court and even any person can approach where is fundamental rights in question that are guaranteed are being infringed so these these are the brief perspective on this and i may tell i'll just go through that all these that, that our constitution has not said that all these rights once they are conferred it is absolute right in the constitution itself provisions have been made i'll i'll just now mention all those where express provisions have been made for abridgement of the fundamental rights by law 
For example, you can have a glance of Article 16.3, Article 19.1 to 6, Article 22.3, Article 23.2, Article 25.2, Article 28.2, Article 31.4 to 6, Article 33, 34. So, and earlier there was a provision Article 358 and 359 that enabled the suspension of fundamental rights during emergency that has subsequently not been approved of. So, these are the provisions. So, the constitution in question, as far as fundamental rights are concerned, it keeps those rights on a very high pedestal. It is one of the highest pedestal on which the fundamental rights in question have been kept. And as you would see that fundamental rights have been included in the constitution because all these rights were considered essential for the development of the personality of every individual and to preserve human dignity. That was the object in mind on account of which this fundamental right in question was kept in the constitution in question and especially under part 3. Further objective of the same was that all people, irrespective of race, religion, caste or sex, have been given the right to move the Supreme Court and the High Court for the enforcement of their fundamental rights. And initially, there were seven categories of fundamental, fundamental rights, but subsequently, one of the fundamental rights, that is, right to property, which earlier was declared to be a fundamental right, that was held not to be a fundamental right, as it was removed from the list of fundamental rights by 44th constitutional amendment that was introduced in the constitution in question. And that was also subject matter of debate sub subsequent to it, inviting a judgment by 11 judges of the Supreme Court in the matter. So the fact of the matter is that we have got six fundamental rights that have been provided to us. Under part three of the constitution, what are those rights? Those rights, those rights have been clubbed, as you would see, that initially it starts with general article 12 and 13, then right to equality has been clubbed under article 14 to 18, right to freedom has been clubbed under article 19 to 22, right against exploitation has been clubbed under article 23 and 24. Right to freedom of religion has been clubbed under Article 25 to 28. Cultural and educational rights have been clubbed under Article 29 and 30. Right to property, as just now I told you, the viewers, that it has been deleted. And other articles have been introduced, such as Article 31A, 31B, and 31C. And right to constitutional remedies has also been provided for under 32, 35. So this is the framework that has been framed for by the constitution makers at the point of time when part three has been put in place. Now, one by one, as it has been cased and it has been referred to, you would see that as far as right to equality is concerned, it runs from article 14 to 18. Right to equality guarantees equal rights for everyone. And not only this, there was no requirement of Article 16, but the fact of the matter is that in order to lay much more emphasis and in order to inspire much more confidence in the public, that equality is not only guaranteed before the law, it is also equally guaranteed in the matter of employment. And it will, and there will be no discrimination made in the matter of employment based on the basis of caste, religion, or untouchability. So, it was a clear cut mandate in question that remove your mindset, clear your mindset, whatever your mindset has been. Now there is a clean slate. The constitution will hold the field and you will have to act as per the spirit of the constitution. All these mindset in question should take a back seat and with open mind, the equality principle should come into play and should be placed on the ground. And the ground reality should show that there is equality before the law and even in matter of employment, everyone who was desirable, 
who was fulfilling the eligibility, eligibility criteria had been given the equal opportunity to participate in the set process of selection and make a chance for himself at this juncture i may also point out the right to equality also envisages in itself though it is not provided for i there are many things that are not written and provided for under the fundamental rights but time and again it has been read that it it is all in the direction of providing equality in order to bring a balance in between two set of citizens that is why policy of reservation has been adhered to in the matter of employment that all all classes of citizens cannot be kept under one umbrella different background historical background has to be kept in mind and that is why article 164 was introduced in the constitution of india providing for reservation though a time frame was provided for but still that is a issue that is going on there is also a issue that is also going on as to whether in the matter of promotion reservation should be provided for or not though the constitutional amendment has been made on the set score also that has been upheld also but the fact of the matter is that that is determinative on the fact that there should be a quantifiable data that should be there on the basis of which reservation and promotions can be made so this is one debate but all these provisions that have been introduced by means of article 164 or article 164a all is are falling in the fundamental rights that have been provided for under the right to equality similarly we will also find that there are various rights that are conferred and gives right to the state and to the government to make laws in reference of children in reference of women article 15 all these rights are to create equality that is the purpose of this right women women are agitating their rights they are saying that we should be treated equally but the law makers know that there is a disparity in the society and and platform will have to be created for women in question and for children in question and for this purpose in question special provisions have been made for the women in question and for children in question i may at this stage also give a case there was one case at uttar pradesh the samajwadi government in question that is the notion is that it's it it supports one particular minority community so they came out with a scheme that was known as samajwadi pension yojana and therein they proceeded to make a mention though it may be a vote catching device but the fact of the matter was that they came out with a scheme that all the all the lady female folk of the members of the minority community who go who go to anganwadi centers get themselves checked up and also see that their children are sent to school in question they would be given a pension of rupees 500 per month that was the policy in question as there are elements of every type so it as it was politically motivated to favor though it was labeled as minority community but the other side came in a repetition challenging the validity of the same that based on caste creed no such law can be made and such a policy that is clearly violative of article 14 16 and other provisions the view that was taken by the court was to the effect that that the policy in question is a good policy for the simple reason that it ensure it ensures two things firstly that 500 rupees would be available only to those incumbents where the children in question goes to school number one that was a way of ensuring children to the school the second was that all these ladies they they get themselves checked up at the primary health centers so the health perspective of the ladies was also kept in mind so based on article 153 this particular policy in question was upheld by the court by the high court and even by the supreme court the idea is that the policy in question can always be framed by the state government as we have already i as i already stated in the very beginning that there is a legislative field provided for there is a concurrent list wherein both the state government and the central government both can frame law there is a list wherein the central government only can frame the law there is a list by the state government so once you have a legislative competence to frame a law and you have a legislative competence to frame a policy also and the policy in question was held not to be discriminatory for the simple reason that it was ensuring 
going of children to the school in question number 1 it was ensuring that women women jo women folk of the village they were getting good medical attendance in question and that was the reason it was upheld so the idea is that equality is not to be applied in abstract equality equality you have to view it from a perspective that they have been discriminated they have been pushed back that is why there is a policy of reservation for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe but there is a special policy of reservation for other backward classes of citizens that is a special class and therein the backwardness in question has to be identified once the backwardness in question is identified then 27% reservation has been earmarked for them that is the idea that is the purpose of this right to equality now the next one is right to freedom everyone knows the right to freedom is one of the most important ideals cherished and guaranteed to the citizen in question freedom of speech you have every right whatever you want to say say but there 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 is the the clutch and the brake is also there with all these provisions freedom of expression you have every right to express no doubt freedom of assembly without arms very good nothing to worry freedom of association society registration act is there you can always form a association freedom to practice any profession it is it is this very provision that we all are on this platform freedom to reside in any part of the country so all these are valuable fundamental rights but all these rights are not free there are sub- certain guidelines and regulations that have been earmarked there are subject to public morality there are places where you have a freedom to go to india any part of the country but there are restrictive rights that restricts that you cannot purchase property that is why that was the reason that right of property has been taken away from fundamental right it is now a legal right that is governed by statutory provisions so all these rights and that is why that freedom of association you have a right to freedom of association you have right to assemble but 144 proceedings are there then you have no right so all these rights that have been conferred under right to freedom clause article 19 to 22 they are all right to freedom but they are subject to certain conditions of state security public morality and decency and friendly relations with foreign countries so the these these are the safeguards and the safeguards are for the benefit of the citizen as well as fellow citizen it is the society at large at the end of at the end of the day whose affairs are to be controlled by the law that is the purpose of law and then comes right against exploitation so th- th- this is a very very touchy as it proceeds to take care of the incumbents whose situation is exploited this human trafficking etc all these are very serious issues and that is why this right employs the provision of traffic in human beings begar and other forms of forced labor it also implies the provision of children in factories the constitution prohibits the employment of children under 14 years in hazardous conditions now that is the right that once you are a human being you have got you should not be exploited you should not be misused that is the purpose of this right against exploitation and the most sufferer of this are the child are the ladies and the children in question this prostitution business this child trafficking business it is, is it, it is in the worst form the government is taking the stringent position to tackle this but the flouters of the law they have their own way of dealing with things they have got no scant respect for the society and for the law in question otherwise this this is a very very touchy article in question provided under the fundamental rights and whenever a situation arises therein as far as this subject of the article 23 and 24 are concerned they always should be touched and dealt with with a human 
heart and a human angle then we come down to right to freedom of religion that is provided for under article 25 to 28 this indicates the secular nature of our indian polity that was the, that as i stated in the very beginning that was our idea of india and that is why you would remember that i mean that secular word has been introduced in our preamble by way of amendment at the point of time it was not at all there that is why recently you must have heard an article of by a chief justice of the jammu kashmir high court where he proceeded to said that it was not required to introduce secular because we from our very inception our very nature we were secular in nature so it was a surplus word but the fact of the matter is that as mentioned earlier the rights are there but to inspire confidence and to provide a benchmark you in, you write all these things in black and white that was why the word secular was emboldened upon that our acts and deeds and our fundamental rights and everything provided for they are all secular in nature but introducing of what secular in the preamble is nothing but reiteration of the earlier existing facts it is nothing but certification of the situation that already existed under the constitution in question that is the idea of introducing what secular and as you must have seen that article 25 and 28 gives a very gives a protective umbrella to the members of the community in question and equal respect to all religions all religions there is freedom of conscience profession practice and propagation of religion and the reason is that we are secular the state has no official religion every person has the right to freely practice his or her faith establish and maintain religious and charitable institutions now this particular article as of now has assumed lot of significance and importance in the present scenario for the simple reason that the country is going around with the triple talaq issue that has been settled by the apex court and therein the apex court has taken recourse to article 14 also and has also taken recourse to article 21 and has also taken recourse to these provisions by mentioning that none of these rights are question in being infringed are being infringed as is being claimed similarly in hijab issue you must have seen that the um, protective umbrella that was being claimed in favor of the hijab was under this very article itself the fact of the matter is that all these in all these religious matters certainly freedom has been given but it is not absolute freedom the freedom in question travels to certain extent but at some place it has to stop because there are certain other disciplines in life where there is interplay of disciplines and interplay of disciplines will restrain you from exercising your right to wear any dress right to wear any dress is part of your fundamental right but right to wear any particular dress in a institution wherein dress code has been prescribed is a issue that is that is not at all falling within the exclusive domain of article 25 and this fact has been made very clear in the in the matter of that babri masjid land acquisition matter as ansari it is by the name of ansari wherein the issue was as to mosque because as we we the the persons who practice hindu hinduism they all have a notion that as far as masjid is concerned that is part of the islam that is how we perceived but the fact of the matter is that supreme court considered the matter in extenso and at the end of the day came to the came to the conclusion that as far as this masjid is concerned it is not an essential and integral part of the islam in question because you can offer your prayer at any place that was the reasoning that was given it is aslam ansari i am as i am recollecting and so here also the the full bench of the karnataka high court has proceeded to make a mention that article 25 is there it certainly provides you the right but that right is a restrictive right as when it has a conflict with other rights then the other rights then this right will have to give way to the other rights also that is the that is the beauty of the constitution in question that it balances everything the constitution does not favor anybody constitution only gives an idea to the judiciary to do a balancing act that is where that 
no one no one encroaches upon any one field that is the idea that is the basic idea so in that context article 25 and 28 is to be seen then we have this right to freedom of religion we have already dealt with then there is cultural and educational rights falling under the head of article 25 to 28 this indicates the this indicates that these rights protect the rights of religious cultural and linguistic minorities by facilitating them to preserve their heritage and culture educational rights are for ensuring education for everyone without any discrimination the law on this subject is very very clear in the case of tma pai 11 judges have sat together and have clearly created to give what is the scope of article 29 and 30 and what is the scope of article 30 of the constitution of india article 30 clearly proceeds to make a mention that the minorities have a right to establish institution and to administer institution that is the unfettered right but now the courts are taking a different view in this direction also because earlier in the matter of appointment etc the minority institution were claiming that they have absolute right and once once there is any interference being made by the executive authorities then it violates and invades our article 30 this the apex court supreme court has proceeded to pass a judgment that that right is there but it is not absolute right once statutory provisions are there there which prescribes that a person should hold this minimum educational criteria that this should be a benchmark then that has to be adhered to we just cannot flout the law and say that we are under the umbrella of article 30 we have got all the unfettered rights the the balancing act has once again been done that is that merit should not be compromised in the name in the name of establishing and administering you have a right to establish and you have a right to administer but in the right of establishment you don't have a right to mal administer that is the short and simple message that has been sought to be given by the courts with the passage of time and the society also develops with the passage of town time and even the judgments that are coming they are all progressive judgments they are not judgment that will take you forward for instance the talaq talaq judgment it's a progressive judgment the privacy judgment it's a progressive judgment and the all these institutions that minority institutions cannot mal administer is a progressive judgment so the courts that have been conferred with this right and that we will deal in the next right that is right to constitutional remedies that 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 is the fora of who who is the who is the adjudicator at the end of the day of all these rights in case there is infringement the constitution guarantees remedies if citizens fundamental rights are violated the government cannot infringe upon or curb any one right when these rights are violated the agree party can approach the courts so the forum has been provided for citizens can even go directly to the supreme court which can issue wish writ for ensure enforcing fundamental rights so the writ remedy under article 226 can be enforced similarly the writ remedy under article 32 can also be invoked and supreme court has repeatedly proceeded to make a mention by contending that as far as rights under article 226 are concerned they are much more wide in nature you can approach the high court for enforcement of your fundamental rights in case there is any breach coupled with this the high court has also got right to enforce the legally enforceable duties provided for under the statute so the power and the contours of the law of the high court are much more wider as compared to article 32 the fact of the matter is that a gist of rights have been conferred with some restrictions some without any restrictions and the moment any breach thereof is complained of then you have a right you have a remedial right and a forum where you can provide provide for and coupled with this there is a caveat also lost at the point of time when all these fundamental rights have been clearly demarcated carved out and written in the constitution question and that was that was in the shape of article 13 and article 13 proceeded to make a mention that no law can be carved out or created that defeats the fundamental rights in question so the so any law that was a pre constitution law 
or any new law or any state law they don't have any right whatsoever to defeat any right that has been provided for starting from this right from article 14 to 32 that that is the crux of the matter and article 13 is very very clear and clearly proceeds to make a mention that all laws in force in the territory of india immediately before the commencement of this constitution in so far as they are inconsistent with the provisions of this part shall to the extent of such inconsistency be void that that is the mandate of law and this this shows as to at how much high pedestal the fundamental rights in question have been put and then there is a further mandate provided for the state shall not make it's 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 a warning to the state it's a caveat to the state the state shall not make any law which takes away or abridges the rights conferred by this part and any law made in contravention of this clause shall to the extent of this contravention be void so that is the so what i'm I've, i have tried to submit that the scheme of things are very very clear and very very explicit and all these fundamental rights they are non negotiable rights in question and this right in question cannot be compromised and once they cannot be compromised the state or the central government by whatever name you call it they have no right whatsoever to make laws that would be inconsistent and that would defeat the rights that have been conferred by this provision in question with this what i feel that as far as part 3 is concerned it is very very yes. exhaustive yes sir yes sir <laughs> and it will it will take volumes and volumes to <laughs> go through so yes. i will stop here by giving one quote of dr ambedkar <clears throat> dr ambedkar was very very he was a very far sighted being the architect of the constitution in question he was very very far sighted and just see the word of caution that has been mentioned by him such such beautiful anticipations they had he said however good a constitution may be it is sure to turn out bad because those who are called upon to work it happens to bad lot however bad a constitution may be it may turn out to be good if those who are called to work it happens to be good lot the working of constitution does not depend wholly upon the nature of the constitution with these golden words i stop here and yes, these golden words have to be kept in mind because at the end of the day it is the politicians and the executive who are the the executor of the constitution in question and as far as the courts are concerned it only de- decides as to whether the constitution in question has been carried out in its word or spirit or not thank you very much thank you thanks a lot sir it was a very fantastic session by you you have elaborated each article in a very well way sir you have incorporated article 16 sir we have certain questions on this which our student are waiting for that more their turns sir the first question from one of the llm student he is asking that what is the difference between constitution and constitutionalism it is the difference is same as a a female and a feminism that is the difference yes yeah, sir yes yeah, sir sir one more student has asked one of the question that do the world secularist need to go through the change in reference to growing the communalism and protecting the fundamental right of the citizens as as i had already stated yeah that even if you were not inserting secularism in the same the the text the context of our constitution in fact is secular in nature once you see all these all these articles paraphrased under part 3 they are all secular in nature when one once you have guaranteed right to equality once you have guaranteed right free conscience right to religion it is all towards secularism so all these rights stand protected and the moment there is encroachment there there are people with vested interest who may encroach upon who may read the law in their own context giving their own color so that is the law that is the job of the court to take out their color and give its true color and meaning that at, as to in what context what is the law in question that should be incorporated and applied 
sir uh, one more student has asked that in the case of the promotion in the promotion of uh, in the central government or the state government so sir what principle is to be adopted because we have a supreme court guidelines that 50% reservation but in the case of promotion so uh, that we have the seniority okay say for example the two categories of the people have they having the same qualification and they have joined on the same date and uh, they have cleared the examination in the seniority so what principle can be adopted in this particular case sir actually it all depends on on the various service rules as per which you are governed yes, different sir. different service rules are there containing different parameters so it yes. is all dependent on the local service rules correct by the terms and conditions of service that will govern the same now sir we have uh, one faculty faz ansari uh, he has uh, one question Uh, Mr. Faz, sir, are you there? Yes, sir. Definitely. Please put your video on, sir, and ask the question to sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much, sir, for such an enlightening session. Thank you, thank you uh, sir. I've got a quick uh, comment and a quick uh, question. Uh, the comment is actually based on the uh, last uh, sentence of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, which you quoted. I think, sir, that is the evidence that Constitution is a living document. That is true. Because if right. something is living, you can make it good or bad. If it is that dead, is then it is the way it is. You so are right. You it, are right. It, it speaks very much for it. You are and absolutely right. Secondly, sir, uh, my question was pertaining to Articles Twenty Nine and Thirty. Uh, when we talk about uh, cultural and educational rights, we we sometimes overstress the religious uh, part of it, and we overlook the linguistic part of it. That linguistic minority is hardly the matter is talked about in terms of policy making or otherwise you are right so, right so sir do you think there is some need from the side of the policy makers to talk more about it because both actually are actually as far as courts are concerned much has been said in tm tma pi yes the broad principles have already been set out and it is for the policy makers makers that to shed out the narrow cocoon in question and come out of the same the they they also don't intend to exercise their rights which have been conferred in the in the correct perspective definitely sir the the politics has its, has its own, own arena <laughs> yes sir. right thank you so much sir. thank you thank you uh, now sir i will tell uh, mn patel sir who is the provost of our university to give a vote of thanks uh, mn patel sir provost sir ji 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 it's yes. really a pleasure for me and i have also heard that no doubt uh, our knowledge in the law is uh, always be there but the explanation made by our uh, honorable justice is really fantastic and i also learned some of the point that how people are misusing that something which is no doubt a right but they are not forgetting the duty and they are only is, is expecting the right for that so on this occasion really it's a pleasure for us to be uh, with us and we hope so that in future also if you have time and our rajesh singh we call you please help us so that our students are definitely be at the benefit definitely so it's really a pleasure for us i am very much thankful to you sir thank and you sir my team of law mr rajesh singh faiz ansari and uh, professor akil uh, they are also arranging such type of talks so i am very much pleased and happy and i am very much thankful to all my dear student participant those who have took the advantage of such a learned speaker thank you very much sir and we will see you in future again thank you very much sir thank you sir thank you thank you provost sir and uh, on this note sir we are very much thankful uh, to you sir on the behalf of parun institute of law parun city so uh, on this note sir we are closing this session thanks a lot sir thanks a lot pranam sir okay sir thank you sir thanks provost sir